Welcome to the Drum Shuffle, a podcast offering insights, perspectives, and conversations for drummers. I'm your host, Jamie Eads. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Drum Shuffle. Jamie Eads joining you as I do each week. This is episode 34. Hope everybody's having a great week out there. We have another great interview for you today. Today, we are going to be joined by Jay Lawrence. Jay has played with literally everybody you can think of. Uh, It's a very interesting story. He's a fantastic educator as well. He has a a new album out that I'm going to tell you about in just a second. So please stay tuned. The best kept secret for drummers is finally out. Los Cabos drumsticks may look like the sticks you grew up with, but these are not your father's drumsticks. Los Cabos drumsticks is Canada's number one drumstick brand, and they are coming to a retailer near you. With operations in over 28 countries worldwide, thousands of drummers have already discovered the Los Cabos difference. Using FSC certified wood from Canada and the US, Los Cabos make the finest quality drumsticks, percussion tools, and accessories on the market. The best news, Los Cabos drumsticks offers you a ton of choice. They have 22 individual drumstick models and 14 percussion tools, many of which are available in three different wood types, maple, white hickory, and red hickory. Red hickory comes from the center or heart of the hickory tree and has been independently proven to be both stronger and more elastic than white hickory without adding a lot of weight. While most drumstick manufacturers have shunned red hickory, Los Cabos Drumsticks has embraced it, becoming the only established stick brand in the world to offer a full line of red hickory drumsticks. To learn more about Los Cabos Drumsticks, visit them online at loscabosdrumsticks.com, follow them on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, and don't forget to ask for Los Cabos Drumsticks at your favorite retailer. Dare to be different. Join the Red Hickory Revolution with Los Cabos Drumsticks. All right, guys, as I mentioned, we're going to be joined in just a second by the great Jay Lawrence. Uh, Jay lives out in Utah. He is a uh, a great professor at uh, BYU uh, teaching percussion. Jay has literally played with with everybody on earth. Um, Let me just give you a short list here. Paul Anka, Cher, um, Tom Jones, Ben E. King, Gladys Knight, uh, Loretta Lynn, uh, Shirley McLean, Liza Minnelli, the Moody Blues, uh, you name it, he has played with them in the casino scene out west. Um, and he's going to talk a little bit about that. He also has a fantastic new record out called Sonic Paragon that I want everybody to check out. Uh, so please help me welcome to the drum shuffle, Jay Lawrence. Hey, good afternoon, Jay. How are you today? I'm doing very well. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Hey, thanks so much for taking time to come on the Drum Shuffle. We really appreciate your time. It's my pleasure. Excellent. Well, Jay, I have uh, actually today um, been sitting here listening to your fantastic new record called Sonic Paragon. Um, It's just a really good record, and I certainly want to talk about that, but uh, one of the things that we always try to do here at the show is to go back to the very beginning. So tell us how you got into music and how you became a drummer. Oh, very good. Okay. I'm tickled that you like the record, but uh, going back, um, my grandpa was a jazz musician, a guitarist. And uh, here's a here was a guy that could uh, basically play thousands of tunes in any key harmonizing the melody, uh, you know, every, every note of the melody, which I understand. Uh, I mean, you know, once I got to know other guitarists, I realized that's kind of a big deal. Uh, he was a, he was a fabulous guitarist and I used to watch him play and think, well, there's something special about this, this music thing. And I tried, uh, a few instruments, cello and piano guitar. But when I found drums, I found something that really spoke to me. And, uh, I loved the fact that uh, 
Drums was not just one thing that you could play with your hands and your feet. You could double on other percussion instruments, and you could play in both bass clef, uh, on bass marimba and timpani, and as well as treble clef and jazz vibes, etc. And uh, the whole drumming percussion family just spoke to me. And so uh, when uh, I had the chance to sign up for junior high band, I made a resolution that nobody was going to prevent me from learning how to play drums. And, and there were 30, <laughs> 34 <laughs> drummers, uh, 34 drummers that signed up. And so the band director was desperate to steer some of us into clarinet and French horn and, you know, some other things. But I was adamant. Uh, I knew where I was going. <laughs> Uh, well, it, it sounds like you fought your way into it. So uh, <laughs> kudos to you, right? It was uh, it was great. Now, I had a, another experience that I think led to this. Uh, I was, well, I don't know, maybe nine years old, and I was walking to the park one day, you know, five or six blocks away. As I got closer to the park, I uh, heard a band playing, and the electricity in the air, the the excitement of live music, you know, by the time I I was a few blocks away from the park, I was at a full sprint. And I ran up, watched this band play, and uh, and for some reason ran to the back of the stage, you know, behind the stage, and watched the drummer's foot. And then uh, I think I was, you know, I was hooked at that point, watching, uh, watching how all four limbs uh, can generate the rhythm. Absolutely. I mean, I, I was much the same when I was a kid. I always wanted that, you know, behind the scenes look, you know, so I could figure things out. So uh, it, it, it is a special moment when you see how everything kind of coordinates together and uh, you you can take that and apply it to your to your own playing. Now, you mentioned junior high band. Now, you grew up in in the western part of the States. And, and I ask all of my guests this. Uh, because it's different based on your geography, were you uh, a marching band guy? Now, a lot of our guests will say, yeah, football's not a really big deal in, in this part of the country, so we didn't really have marching bands. But did you continue on throughout your school career playing in, in school bands and things like that? So uh, I did. Um I was very fortunate that my junior high band director happened to be a drummer. And so he would take us through a couple of books, stick control and the straight system. And he would have sectionals. He would actually, he he made friends with the principal and, uh, and actually worked it out so that we could come out of English or math or any other class and do a sectional once a week. And we'd work with a metronome, and it was a fabulous experience. Uh, there was no marching band in junior high. There was a, a very short marching season, like about two weeks long <laughs> in uh, in high school. And then when another band director uh, took over, uh, there was no marching band whatsoever. Uh, and his focus was uh, jazz band. And so uh, back then they called it the stage band. It was kind of funny. Right. But, uh, but yeah, anyway, I've, that didn't prevent me from learning the rudiments and uh, working on technique and trying to build my chops, make certain that my execution was clean and, and that sort of thing. So uh, once you got through high school, um, you know, obviously you are a, a fantastic jazz drummer. Um, once you got through high school, did you follow a musical path for college or did you just immediately start putting bands together, ensembles, things like that? Oh, that started long before I graduated from high school. Um uh, I joined the union when I was about 15 years old Oh wow! And, start, and started working in the Reno nightclubs, Reno and Lake Tahoe nightclubs, uh, the hotel casino show bands, uh, which was a real blessing to me because I was fortunate to rub shoulders with musicians who were decades older than me and had tons of experience. And uh, all these, uh, you know, two shows a night, six nights a week, uh, there was a lot of work in Reno at the time and a lot of fabulous musicians. And uh, so I got to take lessons from them and 
watch them and learn and ask questions. And uh, it was a great thing. And then I did put together bands while I was in school. Uh, but I also was part of people putting together their own combinations. There's this professional percussion ensemble asked me to be a member. And, and so it was a quartet and we would go around play concerts in the schools. I didn't go to very much, um, high school. <laughs> I, I think my teachers gave me good grades and allowed me to, uh, uh, to graduate because they knew that I knew what I was going to do for a living, and they they probably thought that it was cool that I was playing for celebrities and that sort of thing. But uh, I was out of school perpetually. It, it would be a common thing for me to sit in a class, and some voice would come over the um, intercom, and they'd say, "Is Jay Lawrence in your class?" And I'd say, "Yes," or they the teacher would say, "Yes," and can you send him down to the office? And it got to the point where I stopped going to the office. I knew that I just had needed to go home because um, some show at Lake Tahoe had an opening act that needed a drummer or something like that. So I was perpetually getting out of school to, to go to work. After high school, I went off to uh, Berkeley College of Music and had uh, a wonderful semester. It was only one semester because I went to so many concerts that uh, uh, I quickly ran out of money. But uh, but it was a fabulous semester. I got to study with Gary Chafee through the school and Alan Dawson privately. I actually lived in Lexington. And um, I'd sneak into Gary Burton's classes, and I just, you know, made the best of it. Uh, I was in Charlie Mariano's combo, that great alto player that played with Stan Kenton and everybody yeah. else. Yeah, for sure. Well, you know, one of the common themes of the guests that we've had on the show, you know, we've had a lot of Berkeley guys. And, you know, I think it, it being able to study with Alan or or Gary, either one, it, it's just going to make you a better drummer. Would you agree with that assessment? Those teachers, those two gentlemen are they've got a place in history, I think, in drumming history. They're just such stellar um, musicians as well as uh, intellectuals as far as passing the art form on to the next generation. I think uh, I think I was very lucky to be studying with both of them. And, and, you know, I don't know if you could call me a Berkeley guy having gone only one semester, but uh, I certainly got the best of Berkeley uh, while I was there. Well, I will say this, Jay, you got one semester more than me, so you're a Berkeley guy in my book. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just it's just such a special place, you know, I mean, and there's so many, so, so many great drummers uh, passed through there, you know, and, and musicians of every, you know, ilk. But, you know, I think the drummers, especially, um, you know, guys like Gary Chafee and Alan Dawson and, and just you know, fantastic instructors there. Now, one of the things that I've noticed, uh, Jay, in, in doing some research for our interview, um, just looking at, you know, your studio work and, um, you know, live resume, it makes a little bit more sense, you know, in the Reno area, you know, I mean, I saw Sammy Davis Jr. as, as you know, one of the gigs that you did, but... <laughs> Your, your studio work is very eclectic, and, you know, I'm going to guess that a lot of our listeners have heard your playing, even though they may not have known it. You've done a lot of movies, you've done a lot of jingles, a lot of television, um, a lot of movie trailers. How did that work happen for you? Uh, was it something that you, at some point in your career, said, I would really like to get involved with movies and television, or did these gigs just kind of happen? Uh, very good question. So I've always been a guy that said yes to almost everything. <laughs> okay, well, they, and, and it shows, you know, so, I mean, that's, uh, that's awesome. <laughs> uh, so even if I hadn't, done it before I decided, well, here's a new frontier. I want to explore this and, uh, and do this anyway. So I moved to, uh, when, when the scene in Reno, there was a little bit of recording in Reno, but not too much. And so I, I thought, well, I'll go out to Utah where my parents are living and, uh, I will, you know, save up some money and go down to LA and pursue my career and, uh, you know, make, make a living as a musician down in Los Angeles. 
Uh, however, when I got to Utah, I was surprised, pleasantly surprised, to find out there was quite a scene. And uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, there was um, a lot of uh, composers were bringing their scores up to Salt Lake City and uh, and doing you know, the recordings up there, probably because it was a buyout situation, they could save some money, maybe our scale was lower, and so I'm not sure how I feel about that, but uh, uh, but it was a fabulous experience, and I remember when I talked to um, Joe Procaro, Jeff's dad, once, he said, oh, we had our day, we had our time, uh, enjoy it, uh, say yes to all the gigs you can, you can. and so I, I thought I had permission to, to do those things, and uh, we ended up playing, oh, I don't know, all the Jean-Claude Van Damme uh, movies, all the um, Xena Warrior Princess, that television show that ran for so many years. Uh, we ended up doing, um, oh, let's see, I, I played Sandlot. It was a children's baseball movie and U-571, the submarine movie and Gettysburg and, yeah, lots of things. It was a, it was a good period and, and, and the, the studio work still continues. But nowadays it's more um, singers' albums and, and projects and jingles, but not so much uh, the movie thing. I think it moved on to uh, maybe a cheaper market, unfortunately. Well, I mean, I, I think that's just how the music business is today. You know, <laughs> cut every corner that you possibly can. Um, I, we, I briefly mentioned, you know, some of the celebrity performances. Your resume is literally a a who's who of music over many decades I, I and i'm not exaggerating that at all um just a, a, as an example you know paul anka i see on here um share <laughs> the coasters um you know sammy davis jr i mentioned um it, just amazing resume that you have here and i'm going to assume that is from the casino circuit yes um you know I, I mentioned i think i mentioned that i joined the union when i was 15 and my teachers started recommend I, I was taking two lessons a week uh from two great musician drummers one was uh richard havens and uh, the other one was jerry genario and uh they got together and said, is he practicing for you like he's practicing for me? And, and they decided they would start recommending for me for gigs. So I showed up at my uh, lesson to one of them, uh, to Richie, uh, one week. And he said, all right, we're going to have a slightly different lesson tonight. Uh, um, I'm going to teach you how to mark parts and how to follow a conductor and that sort of thing. And so uh, that's what it was about. And then at the end of the lesson, he said he recommended me for the Barbara Eden show, that uh, that gal that used to play uh, in the television show "I Dream of Jeannie." Of course, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, and so anyway, that's uh, that was the first nightclub show I did, and and uh, I must not have blown it too badly because they kept calling thereafter, and I ended up working in all of the hotels in Lake Tahoe and Reno and Sparks and eventually Las Vegas. I lived in Las Vegas twice. And, uh, so yeah, most of that comes from the Nevada showrooms and there's been, uh, you know, most of the jazz celebrities that I've been privileged to play with and do concerts with, uh, most of that happened here, you know, once I moved to Utah. Wow. Okay. Wow. Okay. Uh, but I mean, it, it, your resume is just it's amazing. I mean, I think most people, most drummers would say, I can die a happy man. I've played with everybody. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, it's just fantastic. So, I, I mean, obviously you've had, uh, you know, this wonderful long career playing with all these folks. Um, one of the things that I wanted to ask about is um, the the great drummer's workbook that you authored. Um, tell us a little bit about where that came into play. Is this something that you had been working on for a long time, or did you just sit down one day and say, I'm going to write a, a, an instruction manual for drummers? <laughs> have you seen a copy of it? I have indeed, and, and it's a great book. Oh, thank you. Well, um you know, I think uh, 
it came about as the result of uh, a few students and one in particular that said he would help me make it happen if I could carve out a little time uh, and and uh, dictate the book to him. And so I got uh, one person to do notation uh, for me, you know, and another person to uh, turn what I uh, was trying to say into English and <laughs> uh, and basically kind of started outlining, uh, outlining the book, uh, deciding that I wanted to create something that would be uh, fairly comprehensive and allow me to sell to students uh, that would prevent them from having to go out and buy 40 books. Now, I'm a guy that owns maybe 100 from books, and and I actually recommend that. I think it's uh, valuable every time we can, you know, purchase somebody else's instructional material and learn from it. I think that's great. But uh, since I've been teaching at the college levels, um, I found that one book that has the best of many books is uh, just kind of what they need for a, for a textbook on the college level. And so that was my goal is to is to have a, a book that uh, kind of concentrates in six prongs, um, those prongs being technique, reading, jazz, rock, Latin, and musicianship. And uh, so I just started collecting my thoughts and outlining what I wanted to you know, have uh, in the book, and eventually it uh, came to fruition. And now I'm uh, glad to say that it's being used at about uh, a dozen different universities. And let's see, Lone Star Percussion sells it. I know there's copies floating around Juilliard, and so I feel fortunate that it's been accepted. Well, I mean, it's it's a great book to work through, uh, you know, no doubt about it. And I, I find that guys that author books are guys that you should be taking lessons from, you know, if they've <laughs> if they've taken the time to, you know, lay it out that way. Um, you know, clearly you have given some thought to it. So I was just curious about it because it is a good book and, and it is out there. So, you know, certainly wanted to plug that now, um, at some point, you know, and I've heard your, your other record, the one that came out, I, you know, I want to say five, six years ago called sweet lime. And I, I think that was a, a quartet. And of course, um, I think you had the great Bob Shepard playing with you on on that particular recording. But at yeah, what, what at, a great guy he is. Oh, yeah. I mean, just a monster player. Um, at what point did you decide, OK, I've done all these amazing gigs. I've had all this great studio experience. I'm going to start, you know, recording my own thing. I'm going to be the band leader. I'm really curious about that because a lot of drummers don't ever take that step to say, I'm going to do my own thing. Uh, I like that question. So you notice my last prong in that drummer's workbook was musicianship. I think as a result of um, who I was hanging out with when I was young, I learned quite a bit about music theory and, and started to fancy myself a composer. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if there's one thing I think composers have in common, it's that we want to document uh, where, you know, where we've been thinking and uh, what we've tried to create. And, and so the first record I did uh, was... Um, using a bunch of friends, uh, great players, uh, people that have gone on to do good things. Christoph Ludi, who was with the Jeff Hamilton trio, and Jeff uh, Campbell, who teaches bass now at uh, Eastman. Uh, they were they were part of this uh, first project. It was 1989. I called it Creative Endeavors. And then I did another record, and Joey DeFrancisco sang on that. Uh, there was lyrics. There was a lot of standards and one original, and I uh, arranged some things for a big band and uh, and a string section. So that was a lot of fun. That was 1996. And then Thermal Strut was um, my record that came out, I'm going to say, 2006. And that was with Lynn Seaton. Uh, yeah, I'm, I imagine you know who Lynn is. Uh, uh, he teaches uh, at North Texas now, but he was with Count Basie and Tamir Hendelman was on piano. Uh, and then Sweet Lime is the other record that you mentioned. Sweet Lime had John Clayton, 
uh, Tamir and Bob Shepard, and that was a lot of fun. And then Sonic Paragon. I don't know if it'll be my last. I'm getting um, getting older, and records are getting more expensive pr- to produce. But uh, <laughs> in, in, a, in a perfect world, I'll do one more. In fact, this summer I kind of went on a chair and, and wrote uh, uh, five new tunes, <laughs> uh, all in the month of July. And so uh, I think uh, I think there's more still in the well. And uh, I would love to actually get to the situation where I could uh, document those things, you know, that writing. Absolutely. Well, let's talk a little bit about Sonic Paragon. Now, you know, everybody that listens to my show understands that I am a fan of jazz music, but I cannot play it to save my life. It's just not, (laughs) it's just not a skill set that I have. And, um, you know, but I enjoy it. I really dig the album. Uh, truly I do. But the, the first thing that jumped out to me, you know, when I started going through the track listing was there is a cover of the great Crosstown Traffic by Jimi Hendrix. And I was like, okay, I've got to hear this. That's fantastic. You know, I mean, that's, I think that's probably the one, you know, kind of cover on the, on the record, but let's talk a little bit about Sonic Paragon. Where did you guys record it and how long did the process take? Because it's a good record and and I really want to give that some due here uh, in our interview. Oh, thank you. Let me, uh, back up and just mention that uh, when I was in fifth and sixth grade, Jimi Hendrix was a, uh, a big influence on me. <laughs> I loved, I loved his music. His music electrified me. And, uh, and so I always wanted to do a song, you know, with some, some Hendrix tune and turn it into a jazz thing. And so that particular tune, what we ended up doing was uh, uh, I, I, you know, turned it into a vehicle where it was a double time swing with some reharmonization and uh and yet you can still hear all the elements and the uh the figure that's so simple rhythmically at the beginning of Crosstown Traffic, I wanted to make it not quite so simple. And uh so anyway that's uh, that's how that happened. As far as Sonic Paragon, uh I th- I would say the way I work is uh you know, a few years out, I, I develop a concept and write some material, choose the tunes that I want to do, include some, you know, a few standards. Uh, and then uh, based on what what I've written, I dream about who I would love to play with. And uh, the good news is I was able to get everybody I went for on this record. Um, Rini Rosness is a piano player that really speaks to me. She, uh, I first heard her at a International Association for Jazz Education uh, conference in New York, and I just thought she was, uh, I, you know, I told myself, i got to play with her someday. She was on there. I think she had Jazz Record of the Year two years ago. John Patitucci, what drummer doesn't like John Patitucci? <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> and Harry Allen seemed to be like the fresh new voice in tenor sax. Um and then Anthony Wilson is the guitarist that um, has been on the road with Diana Krall for so long. I've always loved his playing. It's kind of a straight-ahead, uh, real beautiful player. And Terrell Stafford is, uh, uh, every time he plays, I mean, he's drenched in the blues, and he's uh, he's got uh, a style that uh, I, I love. The other guitarist that played uh, um, acoustic guitar, Homero Lubombo, uh, I've, I've seen him with uh, Trio de Paz and with Diana Reeves, um, Diana Reeves, and uh, and his playing always spoke to me. So the uh, guitarist that, um, well, you know, the first day none of the guitarists could make, and so uh, so some of the guitar stuff is overdubs. The second day, uh, Yotam was there, but uh, uh, but uh, you know some of the guitar stuff is overdubs. Other than that, we did it all. In uh, a day and a morning, you know, about a uh, seven and a half hours one day and about um, three and a half hours the next day. And so I was grateful that they were good readers because it uh, it uh, happened in a hurry. Uh, and, and whatever happened, uh, happened. And, uh, and so I was really grateful that uh, the performances turned out so wonderfully. 
Well, it, again, it, it is a fantastic listen from from cover to cover, as they say in the book world. Um, you know, I, I spent some time with it over the long holiday weekend here and just just dig it. I mean, it's it's fantastic. Um, yeah, absolutely. And presumably it's available everywhere you can find uh, find music. Correct. We use the aggregate uh, CD Baby, and I think they've got it at um, Google Play and iTunes and uh, Pandora, and I'm not sure where else. Amazon Direct, I think. Um, yeah, so it should be everywhere. And uh, it's also available on Jazz Hang Records and, uh, and CD Baby itself, I believe. Uh, you can buy it from them. Uh, so anyway, I'm thrilled that you like it. Uh, it makes... Uh, a composer and an artist, uh, proud and happy that uh, somebody appreciates their work. Thank you very much. Oh, you're you're very welcome. I mean, it it speaks for itself. So we certainly want to you know steer some folks to go listen to to it uh, without a doubt. Now you. you mentioned that that Hendrix was a, a big influence on you, and that's something that that I haven't asked. You know, who are your drumming influences? Because I think it's interesting that that a great jazz player such as yourself mentions Hendrix. Um, but, you know, because Mitch Mitchell, of course, who, who played with Hendrix all those years was a wonderful jazz drummer and he brought the world of jazz to, to electrified rock, you know? So I, I'm, yeah. So I'm curious to hear who some of your big drumming influences are. Well, uh, you know, I'd start with, uh, John Bonham and, um, uh, and Mitch Mitchell and, uh, Certainly Dave Garibaldi was a big influence to me. Uh, Alex Acuna um, early on. Buddy Rich, uh, I, I don't know a drummer that wasn't influenced by, you know, his uh, mastery. And uh, you know, I think he's the king of drums. Joe Morello really spoke to me. I loved his sound. Uh, a lot of people point to, uh, what is it, uh, Take Five. and And the truth of the matter is, a couple of years of uh, world tours and, uh, uh, you know, then they recorded the next album time further out and, uh, and Joe Morello recorded a tune called far more drums. That's what P that's what drummers should be studying because uh, he was white hot during that period. Uh, so Joe Morello was a big influence and, um, let's see, uh, you know, Max Roach, uh, Philly, Joe Jones, Roy Haynes. I went to this, um, Ludwig Percussion Symposium in Eau Claire, Wisconsin when I was about 17. I just drove out and uh, it was such a cool thing because Roy Haynes was there, Joe Morello was there, uh, Dave um, Friedman and David Samuels were there teaching mallets and uh, anyway, it was just a fabulous experience and, and, and uh, that guy uh, Carmine Apice, I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce his name, he was there um, and, you know, from the rock world, Mitch Markovich, the rudimental national champion, he was there and, and it was just, uh, I, I was in heaven. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a, it sounds like it. Week. Yeah. It was just great. Let's see, as far as other influences, I'd have to point to my teachers, uh, Ron Falter, Rich Havens, Jerry Gennario, and eventually, um, uh, the guys at Berkeley, you know, uh, are in Boston, uh, Alan Dawson and Gary Chafee. And then uh, I've, I've studied since then with uh, people like Mike Spiro and Alex Acuna and uh, uh, oh, so many. Really, I, I take lessons every time I go to a, a city bigger than mine. You know, I'll, I'll call up somebody and uh, see if they can get together with me. Last time I was in New York, I uh, got with uh, Gregory Hutchinson. Oh, wow. Well, you know, you mentioned your influences. Um, you've got quite the family tree of folks that have uh, studied with you as well. And, and I know that you teach uh, quite a bit um, uh, out there in your area. I think you're in Utah now. Um, yeah, but, right. but you're are you teaching at BYU? Am I getting that correct? Yeah, I'll, I will be there tomorrow morning. They've got me teaching a, a music business class and a jazz theory class. Uh, 
<laughs> and uh, basically, I, I say yes to whatever they ask me to do. Uh, I'm, well, also teaching, that's, I'm also teaching at Snow College, and, and I lead the percussion ensemble down there and teach a percussion pedagogy class and, uh, of course, a lot of private lessons. Absolutely. Now, in terms of private lessons, if our listeners, do, do you do anything remotely? So if, if one of our listeners says, you know, I would love to get in an hour with Jay, are you only doing it in person or are you uh, able to deliver Skype or, or some something like that? You know, I started down that path and I am so busy that I haven't finished going down that path. I, I, um, uh, bought a Zoom, and I thought, well, I could make this happen. Uh, but uh, I've pretty much already filled every hour of the week. Uh, I'm lucky to be uh, talking to you today because it's a, you know, it's Labor Day, <laughs> a holiday. But, uh, yeah, I haven't um, finished uh, being Skype-enabled yet. I got gotcha. you. OK, well, you know, I mean, so I'm going to recommend to any of our listeners that are traveling through Utah or, or live in that area, certainly to, to look Jay up. I mean, it's it, it's going to be well worth uh, shoehorning your way into his schedule to sit down and study for a little bit. Um cool. So uh, it, it, we've got that out there. Now, let me ask this I, I, on going back to Sonic Paragon, because it is such a great record. Um, I know that you brought in all of these, you know, world class players to record the record with you. Do you do any touring or do you see any touring happening behind that material? Or are you just completely consumed with with teaching and other recording gigs? Yeah, good question. You know, I, I haven't ruled out anything. Uh, I know I'll be playing uh, this material with a with a, a local band at the Jazz Education Network conference, uh, which is in January, and so we'll be uh, traveling out there. Oh, interestingly enough, it's uh, held this year in my hometown of Reno. Um, but I haven't uh, set up any tours and life is so busy. I, I guess I would love to do that during the summer maybe, but uh, uh, yeah, there's so much work here in Utah that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, I haven't really felt the um, need to go out. I, I'm, I'm happy if people are pleased with the music on the record uh, and I would certainly not turn down the opportunity to play uh, all this material uh, you know, anywhere. And so, um, so that's kind of a mixed answer, but, uh, yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I'm asking because the material is so good and, and, you know, I know you stay very, very busy, but I was just curious, you know, it, it's harder and harder, I think for, um, for bands to, to book tours, um, you know, if you're trying to do it yourself, uh, unless, you know, you have some booking agent that that you're paying a lot of money to 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 say, OK, you go here tomorrow and then here the day after that, it, it becomes very difficult. Um, Jay, w one of the things that that I think would be um, very educational to to our crowd here at the Drum Shuffle, um, and this will kind of lead us into our next question as well. But, you know, you're living in Utah and you are staying completely covered up with work as a drummer. Um, you know, a lot of our guests have said, you know, you have to go where the action is, you know, Nashville, New York, L.A., you know, Atlanta, you know, wherever the case may be. But you've made quite a career in some place that most folks do not equate to a music hotbed. How do you stay so busy? You know, it was a surprise to me also <laughs> that, uh, that the scene was as good as it is out here. But I suspect that may be true, you know, whether you're looking at uh, Denver or Portland, Oregon or Phoenix, Arizona, or, you know, Sacramento, California or Kansas City, almost anywhere. You know, I suspect that... Uh, uh, everybody knows about Nashville and New York and L.A. and Toronto. But I think, you know, even somebody in Miami could could be working perpetually. Somebody in Seattle could be working perpetually. You just have to be able to have what's needed 
for the work that's there, uh, be a workaholic like I am. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, uh, I think, uh, I think one, a drummer would not have to necessarily live in New York or LA or Nashville to, uh, to stay busy. Uh, that's my perception based on experience and uh, and noticing that there are guys uh, in every town that do well and um i think part of it is in fact what i teach uh, people in the in my music business class is number 1 it's good to be able to play all sorts of music you want to be able to improvise and read and do various styles and then secondly it's a nice situation to be able to double so that if uh if I get called for something where it's a drum set and doom Beck and timpani and jazz vibes, you know, a recording session like that, I can say yes. Uh, whereas, you know, probably some guys that only play drum set uh, may end up having to say no to an opportunity like that. Well, that, that's a really good point, you know, and I'm, I'm the guy that only plays drum set. You know, you, you can stick me behind a, a you know, a, a marimba or vibes or whatever. And I'm just like, ah, I don't know, you know, so so it's a really good, really good point that um, the, the more tools you have in the chest, so to speak, the more work you can do. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, Jay, one of our traditions here on the drum shuffle, and I, I want to be respectful of your time, but we always ask our guests for a good piece of advice. And, you know, you being a, a, a you know, a master educator, you've had all these incredible gigs, um, putting out just fantastic albums, share some good advice with, you know, our listeners. What have you learned over your career? It may be hard to uh, boil it down to one coherent statement, but let me try. (laughs) Uh, I would say if I was to advise somebody who was younger uh, and just start, you know, on the other end of their career, I would say never stop learning and uh, always seek uh, for new knowledge and uh, seek to hone new abilities. Um, Stay open-minded. It's okay to say yes to a reggae gig or a, a big band gig or something else, a, you know, a nostalgia big band thing or or even a funk gig or a country gig. Uh, it's okay. It's not going to hurt your jazz playing as long as you're, you know, spending a lot of time in the jazz world. It's not uh, going to do anything other than add to your ability to make a living as a musician and maybe even uh, enlarge your vocabulary for uh, the style that you primarily focus on. Uh, So never stop learning and uh, be curious. One of the things that uh, puzzles me about so many uh, young people is they don't go up to a a trombone player and ask the kind of questions that, that I ask. How low can you play? How high can you play? Is this a constant instrument? Is it written in bass clef or or treble clef? I think once we learn what's going on in the rest of the band and we know, you know, how to transpose for a baritone sax and we know how to, uh, uh, you know, write for, uh, we know that bass is written down, you know, sounds down an octave from where it's written. All those kinds of things are just part of being curious and finding out what the big picture is in, in music making once you understand the big picture and uh, the fact that uh, various ingredients come together to create musical recipes, now all of a sudden you have the ability, you know, if you really understand the nuts and bolts of music theory, you have the ability to create your own music and not just be the, the guy that's laying down two and four on somebody else's tune. You know, you can write your own material. So I don't know if that's what you were looking for, but that's what I, that's what I would have and often tell uh, people that are taking lessons from me. Well, I, I think that's exactly what we're looking for. Um, you know, and, and historically speaking, drummers by and large have been sidemen. And, uh, you know, I, I point this out all the time, you know, almost my entire career has been as a sideman or, you know, as a member of a four or five person group, a band, you know, if you will. 
And, you know, I think guys like you, Jay, are are who drummers should aspire to be that can take control of their career and do their own thing. You know, I'm going to be the leader of this band or I'm going to put out a recording project and invite other players in. Um, You know, so for me, one of the goals of this show is for drummers to hear that it's okay to take the bull by the horn, so to speak, and aspire for something bigger than just being in a band or just being a hired gun. Um, So that's one of the reasons that we have guys like you on this show. And I think it's fantastic advice. So anything you can add to that, the floor is yours. Well, that's, that's wonderful. We're on the same page because uh, I think, you know, it's, we, we know that it's uh, tough to have a career in the music business, but it becomes infinitely easier when, uh, when we're kind of the ones calling the shots. Um, yes, I do say yes uh, when the phone rings and, uh, you know, I'll play all sorts of stuff. And, and when somebody texts me and asks me to come clinic their rhythm section at a high school or something, you know, I'll often say yes but I can also pursue my own projects and be part of a band or be the leader of a band. Uh, I just did a show about a week ago. It was America's Music and Dance, where I fronted a big band, hired some dancers, and uh, and was able to uh, put on a show for the for a city in uh, northern Utah that uh, uh, I think uh, enjoyed enjoyed the show very much. And so that's uh, one of the things that if you keep doing stuff like that, uh, you can build, you know, one night at a time, one day at a time, you can build a nice career. I, I, from your lips to God's ears, as they say, <laughs> you know, I, I think that's, I think it's fantastic. Um, Jay, I want to thank you so much uh, for your time. Uh, you are welcome on this show Anytime you want to come back, uh, I know you stay super busy, but please um, keep us posted uh, and let us know uh, if there's any new releases coming out. Um, we would love to have you back uh, whenever your schedule will allow. Folks, you can find Jay at jlawrencedrums.com. Look him up. Go pick up a copy of Sonic Paragon. It's just a fantastic album. Jay, thank you so much for your time today. We appreciate it. Jamie, it's been a real pleasure to speak with you. I've enjoyed the the interview very much, and uh, thank you so much for having me on your program. Oh, it was our pleasure, Jay. We'll talk to you very, very soon. All right. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. All right, guys and girls, that's going to do it for episode 34 of the Drum Shuffle. As always, thank you so much for tuning in. We cannot do this without every single one of you doing so each week. We love hearing from you. Send us an email. The email address is the Drum Shuffle Podcast at gmail.com. Our web address is the Drum Shuffle.com. You can find more information about me over at jamieeds.com. Go ahead and hit the subscribe button on whatever platform you're using to listen in. We have some confirmed guests coming up that you are not going to want to miss, including Brad Morgan from the Drive-By Truckers, the wonderful drum historian and master engraver. All of those beautiful engraved Ludwig snare drums that you've seen over the past uh, 25 years uh, have been engraved by a gentleman by the name of John Aldridge. John is going to be joining us on an upcoming episode here uh, very, very very soon. Uh, and we also have uh, a great jazz drummer from Russia by the name of Sasha Mashin that's going to be joining us as well. And you're not going to want to miss any of those episodes. So hit the subscribe button. Make sure you don't miss one of those episodes. Uh, again, thank you so much for tuning in. We really, really appreciate it uh, over here at the Drum Shuffle. So as always, until next time, may your heads stay strong and your sticks never break. Cheers, everybody.